Thanks, Matthew. Kia ora tato. Welcome, everyone. So, it's an incredible privilege uh, to be here opening this year's media conference with you. I just want to echo um, Matthew Sanks briefly to our lineup of speakers and sponsors. And she and Matthew, in advance to um, Thomason and the organising committee and Parter Coopers. So this is an entirely uh, volunteer effort, and I'm sure you've got some sense of what it takes to put this on every year. Um, so a huge thank you to everyone who's been involved, and uh, thank you for taking the time to be here. If this is your first NDF, then um, I think you're in for a treat. You know, the, the role of an opening address is um, to help set the scene for a conference, but bear with me because I want to start out talking about failure which is kind of an odd way to start. Um, but as you might expect, it's not all doom and gloom. And to be honest, I've been waiting years um, for an opportunity to give this talk, so it just feels like the right time. I'm going to start by sharing with you um, the story of a project that I launched that completely failed. And it's not a story that's well known. In fact, I, I don't think there's anyone here today who actually knows So I'm sharing this because I want us to remember that for every amazing idea or initiative or digital thing we hear about at this conference, there are probably 10 other failures, um, stupid ideas, things that just didn't work out as planned. And I want to say that I think that's okay. We often hear about failure as being a good thing. You know, the road to glory being littered with failed endeavours and the likes of um, you know, how not to make a thousand light bulbs before finding success. But I regret that we don't talk openly enough about um, our failures or the things that don't work. Because learning um, from each other um, is, about, is, is what this NDF network is about. Um, learning from each other and working with, it, with each other to do more than we can do alone. In any case, let me take you back to 2008, prior to the general election. And let me introduce you to, in my opinion, one of the most fabulous collections we have um, in New Zealand. Um, and that's the New Zealand Cartoon Archive. Now, if you're not familiar with the Cartoon Archive, it really is fabulous. Um, its purpose is to collect and make accessible New Zealand editorial cartoons. And it has over 50,000 New Zealand cartoons going back um, from the 1860s. And they cover an incredible range of um, uh, topics to do with life in New Zealand, covering social issues, economics, sport, culture, history, etc. This is from 1899 um, by Ashley Hunter, and it's showing a woman who's turning the helm of state away from the direction in which Prime Minister Seddon wants to head. Uh, Gordon Kalman in 1917 here is depicting the sorrow felt by New Zealanders for the number of soldiers um, killed in the First World War. And of course we've got, we've got humour. Um, this one from Tom Scott. So the record of New Zealanders and Australians making fun of each other is very well recorded um, in the archive. I think we've got a few Aussies here today. Yeah, you're very welcome. <laughs> So this collection also says a lot about our place in the world. This one from the Nuclear Free Era in 1984 by um, Bob Brokey. And our local issues. Um, this again from Tom Scott in 2003. And of course politics. This one from Rod Emerson in 2010. It's a funny thing being an institution connected so closely to government. Um, I think that's not unusual in any way. Of course, you know, local libraries and many museums and archives are most often funded by local government. Um, and the National Library and Alexander Turnbull Library are both part of internal affairs. It's funny in the sense that you know, one of our jobs as a library is to support open access to information. Um, and I should say those are my words, not any kind of official declaration. But the role includes holding information in our collections about the political views of society 
at points in time throughout New Zealand history. And yet, as public servants, we also need to be very careful not to express our own political views in the context of our work, um, you know, and rightly so, of course. So sometimes there's a narrow path to tread with lines not to cross. Now, I've always believed that um, getting as close as possible to those lines is where we need to be in the digital context. Things change so quickly for our digital services that often what starts out as risque um, can be an emergent norm um, by the time we actually get something um, out the door. But narrow paths and lines, of course, invite increased risk of failure, which brings us back to our story. Back in 2008, there were a few of us who thought that we could do a lot to raise the visibility of the New Zealand Cartoon Archive, you know, to celebrate it and to see more people engage with and get value from this incredibly insightful and thought-provoking you know, window into New Zealand life. So we hatched a plan, and it involved students, politicians, and a general election. You know how this ends, right? We decided that the best way to do this was to run a competition and get people to create their own cartoons um, and then use that experience to connect them with the cartoon archive. Now, my recollection is that it was the mid-2000s when we started to see online experiences that were really enabling the creation of new works. Some of you may remember a service called Jump Cut, um, which was purchased by Yahoo in 2006. It was a space where people could upload video and actually edit it online. Um, adding effects, splicing frames together, etc. Um, it was entirely built in the browser, though, so there was no desktop software. It was kind of a revelation. And so we were like, where can we get the online um, equivalent where people can create cartoons for our competition? And so we came across a, a service called Paxton, uh, based in Canada. Now, Paxton is still around today. Um, this is their, their website. You should check it out. It is very cool. Um, it's basically a visual environment that allows you um, to create and share your own cartoons. It's got templates and tools and, and what have you. We pretty quickly realized, though, that we didn't know the first thing about how to make great cartoons. Um, but we were very lucky to get the support of a well-known uh, New Zealand cartist who, cartoonist whose work is actually in the archive. Now, I don't actually have permission um, to share that person's name, so they'll need to stay anonymous for now. But the important thing was that they helped us figure out how to make this competition work. And they started by designing New Zealand objects that could be set up in templates inside Paxton. And this, of course, is the Auckland Sky Tower. And then they started playing around with ways to make it easy um, for people to get started. So the concept being that we'd create a base template inside Paxton um, that would set the scene and then people could copy and paste the elements, move them around um, to tell their own story. Here's another early um, story panel that was worked up. So that was all well and good, but honestly it just it wasn't quite getting us excited. Um, yes, we may have seen a few people having a go, but it just didn't feel like it would really take off. So we decided to step up to that line I mentioned earlier. An idea that had been in the back of our minds was that what if we encouraged um, people to create their own political cartoons? So the New Zealand Cartoon Archive, of course, is about ed editorial cartoons. So there was a better fit with that idea. And this was prior to the, again, the 2008 general election. And we got this idea into our heads that, um, you know, wouldn't it be great if schools could use such an activity to help teach students about you know, freedom of speech, political satire, information democracy? You know, all in that context of the elections um, and all in the context of the cartoon archive. And so the next graphics I got from our cartoonist were of John Key and Helen Clark. And I admit to starting to feel a little nervous at this point. <laughs> um, so this was heading into a space that could either be wildly successful or um, could go terribly wrong in terms of um, consequences, not just for the team working on this, but also for the library. And I remember talking to our then director and deputy chief executive at the time. You know what they said? They said, go for it. Now this was by no means them giving us um, their full seal of approval. This was them backing us to keep working on it. 
So that ability for some leaders to support their people in doing not just something different, but something kind of way out there on the edge, um, has become an enduring memory for me of that time in the National Library. And I think it's a leadership quality that is so important in our field of work. So I told our cartoonists that we were going for it, and um, could they please work up some frames of pe that people could use to express their own political views? And I was sent this. So in preparing for this presentation, I was looking at my um, email correspondence at the time, and I said something like, great, but could we have something with a bit more balance, please? And in reply, I got this. And if you want to come and talk to me afterwards, um, you can ask me who this is supposed to be. I'm not going to talk about it here. Um, and then we also got this one as well. So looking back on this, I am kind of amazed we got as far as we did. We got as far as the Electoral Commission um, before this was shut down pretty quickly. In terms of our goal of trying to raise the visibility of this amazing collection, it was a complete failure. Um, nothing happened. It was, it was a real wasted effort. And it was a downer because, you know, we'd all put a lot of time and effort into this. Um, you know, there were communication plans, press releases. I mean, we were ready to go. And I felt that we'd had a good chance of reaching people in, that our library had never connected to before. You know, and introducing them to their documentary heritage in a, in a really exciting way. And part of me now looks back on this um, as a pretty silly idea, but I also think it's kind of funny. Um, I don't regret it, though. I think it was still worthwhile because there were other interesting outcomes. Most unexpected for me um, was that the cartoonist we'd been working with became really enamored with Paxton and went on to establish a significant profile with them for a whole series of um, new regular cartoons. This work also inspired us to partner with um, Auckland Museum on Digital New Zealand's um, Remix Editor later in 2008. The idea of finding or creating online spaces where the public could engage with our collections in different ways and create new works was formed for me during this period. And ultimately, um, this failed effort was the origin of Mix and Mash, the great New Zealand Remix and Mashup competition from which over the years we've had incredible examples of New Zealanders interacting to create new works on top of our collections. And most of you know about Mix and Mash, but I love sharing examples of the work because there's such talent out there in our communities um, that our institutions can connect to. And it reminds me that our digital materials are not just for looking at, but they can be used and they can be used to create things. So entrants um, had to include at least one piece of uh, reuse, reuse, reusable New Zealand content um, in their works. This is a work from Alan Shower called um, Cross Cultures, which is a remix of images from cartoonist um, Dylan Horrocks and poetry by uh, Renee Liang. We had an interactive Mihi Mihi uh, by Graham Jensen. Tane's Tale uh, by Georgia Rachel and Nicole Chappell um, was this delightful mixed media storybook uh, about the importance of looking after our forests. This is a forestry infographic um, by uh, Jessica Shurich. What Happened by uh, Sadef Laurie, Ricardo Scott, Jared Bishop and Alex Gibson was this um, remarkable children's story and data mashup. Polaroid from Uncertain Times by Chang Xian Wong. An Opal Dream Cave by Jim Yoshioka. Uh, remixed poetry from Catherine Mansfield and photographs from the National Library. A grandmother by Candy Elsmore tells the story of her grandmother's signing of the suffrage petition. And we even ended up with a mix and match category um, for cartoons, where we finally got to um, partner with Pixton. This was the winning entry called Trade Me by Heidi Bush. So these are all things that came about in part thanks to our misguided efforts with this failed project. So what do we take from failure? I mean, we've all had to cope to some degree with failed efforts in our digital work, and there are lots of things um, to learn, but I want to offer you one takeaway. Be bold. Whatever your thing is, stretch for something more. And look, it may not pan out, 
you could absolutely crash and burn. Um, but if we never reach for these things, they certainly won't happen. And you will always get something out of it. In this room, you're surrounded by people who can support you in being bold. So here we've got ideas to inspire, uh, skills to use, and even maybe a little bit of funding to share. I'm sure it's out there. Um, and you should just go for it and figure out a way because there are definitely better, things that we can do better at. With that in mind, um, at this conference, we've identified three challenges that we want to explore. What you'll find up in the Oceania room, um, where we have our breaks and lunch, are three boards that each pose a challenge uh, of national significance. On the boards, we're first asking for your input on what are the problems in that area. I hesitate to say we're completely failing, but these seem to be things that are just not working out um, as well as we need them to. And then also on the boards, we're also asking for ideas on how to meet those challenges. So you have an opportunity during the breaks to think about these things. And there should be a facilitator hanging around um, so you can have a bit of a chat about these things, but talk to each other as well. Uh, during lunchtime tomorrow, there's also a, a roundtable discussion where you can sit down and have a proper talk um, about some of these things, if you're so inclined. We'll then bring it back um, all together and report back on um, some possible next steps for these challenges. So what are these challenges of national significance? Number one, being smarter about digitization. So this has always been a challenge, yeah? Um, but why do we care? We care about creating digital versions of our collections because that's how increasingly people want to access the stuff. Um, and we can do wonderful things to engage and inspire and educate in the digital environment. And we're excited about the possibilities um, of applying computation and digital humanities and all of that good stuff. But more importantly, I think, we face a world where, for many people, the online source of information is their only source of information. And if that material is not there and not online, it's like it doesn't exist. And that's not good for our society. Um, NDF has just had the results of its 2014 digitization survey come in. So out of 63 organizations, um, 58 are planning on digitization, digitizing material and making them available next year, which is great. Here's the kicker though, 46% have no funding to do this work. So it's great that we're having a go, um, but we're clearly lacking investment. The things that are holding us back are pretty much the same as they, they were last year. Um, staffing, funding and time. The challenge for us is to get smarter about how we undertake digitization across our institutions. So please join that conversation if you've got something to share. And um, if you're interested in the survey results, they're in the, uh, the NDF board report um, that's online, online. Number two is about community content. So, so what is community content? So my definition is that it's the significant material um, from our homes, our nonprofits, community groups, social media, um, that hasn't yet made its way into a um, a collecting institution. So this challenge comes about from the state that our community Kete are in. So Kete are digital repositories where local communities can load up digital materials, um, copies of stuff related to their community, photos, videos, you know, documentary heritage, etc. And there are more, of t more than 20 of these around, around New Zealand. Um, and there's a specific issue to address about what should happen with these repositories and the material in them. But this challenge also recognizes that our institutions are not the only ones working to collect and make accessible um, our culture and our heritage and our knowledge. The broader question posed by this challenge is whether there's a better way for us to connect together our collections um, with the content outside in our communities. And the final challenge is a bit of a wild card. Um, when we think of the organisations that are part of the National Digital Forum, we often think of what we in New Zealand call the glam sector, you know, galleries, libraries, archives, museums, and that, that broader cultural and heritage sector. But I think we often forget that we also have significant interests in science and technology and information that, um, you know, is knowledge that powers our country. Think of the scientific information held in our museums, um, for example, like through the work that Te Papa does in the natural sciences, 
or all the research undertaken by our university members, and not to mention uh, New Zealand's Crown Research Institutes. Data is a precious resource um, that we and our future generations will use to understand and learn from. And I think, I think we're, f we're facing a growing issue in regard to um, how we digitally collect and store and preserve and make accessible this research data. So I think we're interested in finding out whether this is important to you um, and whether you've got anything to offer in terms of what might be done about it. So there you go, that's my ode to um, failure, success and challenge. And look, if these three challenges are not your cup of tea, that's okay. You know, there's a tremendous amount going on at this conference. Take what you need, um, contribute what you can, and just have fun, yeah, and be bold. Thank you. Um, just before um, I introduce our first keynote, I want to give you a, a brief shout out to the Skillshare event happening during tomorrow's lunch. One of the things that NDF has been um, playing around with is figuring out how to better share the collective skills across our institutions. Um, there are a lot of organisations that could really benefit from borrowing some skills for a few hours or a, a, even a few days. Um, and it could be some user experience testing, some digitisation planning, um, you know, mobile, mobile strategy, whatever. So the Skillshare event during tomorrow's lunch is going to run a bit like speed dating. Um, and so if you could use some help, you should turn up and meet a bunch of people who have put themselves forward to help. You may also notice a few people around who have kind of Skillshare stickers on their name tags. And um, so they're your potential Skillshare dates. And um, if you want to volunteer to participate, um, then you could uh, go and speak to the people at the NDF stand um, during one of the breaks. So it now gives me great pleasure to welcome Brewster Carl to the stage. Um, a digital librarian with a mission to provide universal access um, to all knowledge. It doesn't get much bigger than that. Brewster is founder and director of the Internet Archive, um, the free digital library that archives the web and makes it accessible to everyone. Earlier this year, the number of archived web pages um, in the Internet Archive hit 400 billion. It's an incredible number. After graduating from MIT, Brewster invented uh, the Internet's first publishing and distributed search system called WACE. Uh, WACE incorporated created the online presence for many of the world's largest publishers and was purchased by America Online in 1995. In 96, Brewster co-founded Alexa Internet, which interestingly, um, I found out, it says that it had its services built into 80% of our web browsers, um, which was later purchased by Amazon. And in 2012, Brewster was um, inducted into the Internet Hall of Fame for his work to archive and protect the web. Over the weekend, I was reading an article in Wired um, about Brewster, and he said at the time of his induction into the Hall of Fame that the thing that I've learned about um, uh, of operating a library of everything is that people don't want to feel like they're being taken advantage of. If they do feel like they're being taken advantage of, they'll throw things at you. They'll throw laws at you. They'll try to take you down any which way they can if they feel like they're being taken advantage of. So the key thing for me is to stay on the other side of that line, he said. Brewster, I think, is someone who knows how to walk up to that line. Welcome to the National Digital Forum, Brewster.